If you enjoy watching Common Ground online, please consider making a tax-deductible donation at lptv.org. Lakeland Public Television presents Common Ground, brought to you by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota. Common Ground, I'm your host, Scott Knudsen. On this episode, get a taste of summer at Bemidji's Natural Choice Farmers Market and tour a farm where some of the produce is grown. I'm Dwayne Hayes, I'm chairman of the Natural Choice Farmers Market here in Bemidji, Minnesota. We're here to offer our produce for our customers and hopefully meet some new customers today. The Minji Natural Choice Farmers Market is put together by a, a small group of people. We had another farmers market in the area and that disbanded, so we had to make a choice and four of us got together and established this one. And it was started with originally about four or five members and today we have about 30 members. We're a diverse group, we have a lot of crafts, we have paintings, we have ceramic dealers, we have pastry makers, along with the vegetables, and I'm a bison producer, and I offer bison meat from about 16 different products. We're here to help supply our, our customers. The Midgey Natural Choice Farmers Market is in the area across from Pollen Bay. It's in a parking lot down here, the old Food for Less building, or Blue Ox. We've been down here at this location for, I think, going on about four years. We're pretty well established. What's uh, unique about our market or it's kind of in our bylaws, everybody here has to be within 40 mile radius of Bemidji. So I mean you're talking with the culture, with the people, are, are all local. We have made some exceptions at times for out of the area, but that's on a case by case basis. Otherwise you're dealing with, with all local people uh, within the area. We want to emphasize it's all personally made. Everything that's either raised or produced is is made right here. My name is Ariane Begenstas. I'm at the Bemidji Natural Choice Farmers Market and I am running the credit card and EBT or SNAP account for the farmers market. So most of our vendors are participating in one or both of those. So you can come to the market and run your card through me and then spend your tokens at the market. It's an opportunity to spend. Most of our vendors take checks as well and cash and also now we can add to that credit card and food support. So it's nice for the vendors, it's nice for the consumers, and it gives everybody a lot of choices for how to pay for their goods. So you can come to the farmer's market and when you use your EBT or your credit card, you scan it through my machine and I give you tokens and or market bucks in place of cash. And then you can use that at any of the participating vendors, which is most of our vendors for most things. And they're all labeled so that you know who accepts what form of payment and then they simply reimburse with me later. So you just have to grab tokens and go shopping. <laughs> That's all you have to worry about. Local produce and in this case at our farmer's market also baked goods and crafts too are really accessible to people of lower income. They're not, not just accessible but I would say really beneficial and really important for people who think that they have to shop at a certain place or with certain requirements, come to the farmer's market and check it out and see what you can find for good prices. And it's not expensive. It's not stuff that's really strange or odd that your kids won't like or your families won't eat or you're not used to. It's all stuff that you're already probably serving, except that you can get it from people that grew it right here. It's also a real benefit to have the farmer's market here so people can see where food comes from in general. It surprises me some of the people who come through and buy food from the market and how little kids are maybe for the first time seeing what they can, you know, what happens with food, who grows it, where it comes from, how long it takes to grow it, and what it means if it's cold in the spring or cold in the fall for what they can get at market. I'd say one thing that people probably aren't really familiar with is how easy it is 
to use your food support benefits, also WIC, you know, and the credit cards at the farmer's market. It's not a big deal. It's not a lot of hubbub or paperwork on their end. And if you're not sure, you know, how easy it's gonna be, you can always come to the farmer's market and ask me, or you can go to the county building and talk to them and they'll answer questions. But it's a very user-friendly program. Hi, I'm Jeff Molnar from Molnar Gardens, and we're at the Natural Choice Farmers Market today. We're selling naturally grown produce that we bring from our farm 15 miles north of Bemidji. And we're having a lot of fun. It's a beautiful day. We'll sell from about 9 o'clock in the morning till 3 o'clock. We've got about 20 different kinds of vegetables with us today. And my daughter, uh, Anastasia, is helping me. And earlier, Danielle, my daughter, was helping me. All six of my children helped me in this business all through their life. And even now as adults, they're coming here today to help me sell the vegetables. My wife this morning was helping me pick sweet corn. It's probably not her favorite job in the world, but she was out there helping me get ready for today. Uh, those are all things that help bring all this together. In a lot of cases, it's a very much a family affair and you just gather as much help from your family as you can. The Natural Choice Farmers Market just began about four or five years ago and we've added a lot of new vendors here every year. There's so many different things from baked goods uh, to some jams and jellies. There's even an artist here doing some face painting for the kids. We usually have music here. And then all the different kinds of great vegetables, fresh fruits and vegetables. I think it offers the community a great place to shop and get the highest quality in certain foods and certain things that they could possibly get. Some of the greatest satisfactions I have is having people come back to me sometimes almost every week telling me how good everything tastes and how uh, well it did for them when they're cooking it and preparing it. So I think that really the most satisfaction is seeing people that are satisfied and they're happy with the quality of the produce that they get. And they come back time after time. We've had customers coming to us now for 20 some years and through the years I get to know the customers on a personal name basis. On any given Saturday I think we probably have a few hundred customers go through the market and so you know I get to see a lot of people and I meet a lot of new people. There's always the uh, enjoyment of meeting new customers and seeing new faces. And some customers actually come out to the farm. Uh, today, a certain customer that comes every Saturday uh, would like to buy some rutabagas. I didn't have any rutabagas here today. So at about 4.30 this evening, they're going to come and pick a few rutabagas right out of the garden. A lot of people like to see where things are growing or how they're growing. It adds so much to the market atmosphere if you could have a home visit at a farm. And why don't you guys come on out and visit me at the farm and we'll see what's cooking. We're standing in the middle of about a five acre garden, all naturally growing. And we grow about 20 to 30 different kinds of vegetables for Bemidji's Natural Choice Farmers Market. Well, organic gardening or natural farming really has about three or four main components. And one of them is what you put in the ground for fertilizer. We never put a chemical fertilizer in. We always use uh, composted animal manures and vegetable matter. And we incorporate that as heavy as we can in the soil early spring, but usually early fall or late fall. And uh, the more of that you can put in, the more fertility you'll have and the, the bigger the plants will grow. One of the main differences between, let's say, a chemical use uh, application for fertilizer and an organic one is that the uh, microbes, the soil life, and, and the earthworms and all the uh, animals that live in the soil flourish with the natural additives. They use it as food and they actually produce refuse which acts as uh, fertilizer for the plants. The chemicals uh, actually burn and actually eliminate and kill some of the microbes and animals that live in the soil. So when you're feeding the soil uh, naturally, you're increasing the life of the soil. Uh, you're increasing the length of time that it will be productive. When you add chemicals, you're uh, decreasing the life of the soil and you're lowering the longevity 
of the, the soil life. The water situation this summer has been very dry. And one reason why the plants look so good in this dry year is because the soil was worked up so well and there was so much compost added to the soil. Uh, it created like a sponge effect in, in deep down in the soil and held the water and protected the water from evaporation. You know, the pH of the soil is very important, and a, a pH around 6 to 6.6 6 is ideal for most of these garden vegetables. When I tested mine, it was about a 6.5, which uh, is another reason why everything looks so good. Well, one of the most important parts of an organic farm are the tools that a farmer has, and these are some of mine right here. I've got an old uh, 52 case tractor. I pull a, a chisel plow with that tractor, a Graham home plow that digs my soil about 12 to 15 inches deep. Uh, some of the other tools that I have are a little earthway seeder that I seed most of my garden with. This is, this is about 20, 25 years old. It works for almost all vegetables. A farmer's hoe is one of the most important tools that I'll ever have, and this is my prize hoe right here. Notice how small the edge is, and that's so that I can pull it through the soil and be real efficient with it. It's a sharp hoe. And then I've got a wheel hoe cultivator. This is a, a two-handle cultivator with a stirrup hoe on it. Uh, the 12-inch stirrup hoe cuts the weeds uh, like this, and then the, it pulls them out on the back pole. This is a very important tool. And also another tool that organic gardeners use, they cut and mow a lot of the weeds. And this is an old fashioned side that my uncle sent me from Michigan. And a lot of times if the thistles are growing or the burdocks, we'll just cut some of those out with a sai and uh, eliminate them. And then the, the nicest tool that I've ever been able to get is an eight foot New Holland rototiller. It really does a job in this garden, and we increased our garden by three times when I got it. It was pulled with about a 45-horse Kubota tractor. Well, one of the favorite things that I grow on the farm are cantaloupe. This is a 200-foot row of uh, special cantaloupes that we grow for northern Minnesota, and they're just turning ripe now. And I'm going to pick a couple of these and show you. And you know they're ripe when they pop off the vine like that. My very first experience in gardening was with my grandmother in Michigan, and the main thing that she grew were cantaloupe. So I started with cantaloupe in my gardening career as a little boy. Uh, so now they're still my favorite. Well, I wanna show you some onions here that grew in the middle of cantaloupe. Uh, this, these uh, cantaloupe were, were actually volunteer cantaloupe from the melon patch last year, and I saw them coming up earlier in the onion patch, and I let them grow because there's about, oh, six or eight beautiful little French melons in here. They're, they're still green. And then here, these are the beautiful candy onions that grew right with them. This is really something to see. This is what you could call a companion uh, planting of onions and cantaloupe. And look at those beautiful candy onions. Well, these onions were growing in ground that had chicken manure and wood ashes applied to it last uh, summer. And that's how potent and how good uh, certain fertilizers, natural fertilizers can be. A whole year later, we're still having uh, crops like this come out of the ground with the chicken manure and wood ashes. That's my favorite fertilizer. Well, this is cucumber harvest here. We're gonna pick a few of these beautiful green cucumbers down here. And uh, cucumbers have to be picked every other day or, or they'll get too big. So this is something that we have to stay right after. And it's literally full of cucumbers in here. These would make an excellent, excellent salad. Well, here we have some uh, sugar snap peas growing on a fence. They were planted in mid to late July. And normally you'd never plant a pea that late, but the weather cooled off so much this year that it enabled the germination of the peas to come up at about an 80% rate. And now, uh, several weeks later, you can see the beautiful pea blossoms on here. Here we are uh, into September. We're gonna have peas probably through the middle to the end of September uh, that many times we would never have had. Well, right here I planted several rows of uh, lettuce, spinach, and radishes, 
at about the same time I planted the peas. And they've already been harvested, uh, some of them, and some of them are still growing, as you can see. Uh, there's, uh, oh, the radishes are about done over here. But uh, this is some spinach that was harvested already. There's a little bit left. Well, over here, I've got a couple different lettuces planted that are looking pretty good. Uh, this first one is a red-tipped uh, yellow lettuce called prize head. You can see how beautiful it is in the row. And then beyond that is a red romaine lettuce that I'm growing, a, a deep red romaine. And uh, this lettuce will last a lot longer than some of the other ones for harvest. Over here we have some escrow mix, some different kinds of mixes of greens with uh, several kinds of uh, beautiful greens in, in, those, uh, in that planting. Well behind me is a 30 by 96 foot hoop house that I just constructed a year ago. And we have tomatoes and peppers growing in the hoop house. And the thing that I found about the hoop house is because there's no dew falling on the tomatoes every morning or night, they stay very healthy. They grow very beautiful tomatoes and the peppers uh, have enough extra heat in the hoop house to turn red. So we get some nice sweet red peppers out of the hoop house. The farm is uniquely situated right at the top of the Continental Divide or just off the top of the Continental Divide. As you go just a quarter mile uh, to the north here, uh, the peak of the Continental Divide exists and the water shed flows to the north from that area just a quarter mile away and on this side of the Continental Divide it flows to the south or to the Gulf of Mexico and to the north to the Hudson Bay in Canada. So it's, it's a unique place. It's been a lot of fun to explore this farm. In many ways this garden represents a lifetime of my work. This is probably one of the nicest organic gardens that I've ever had and it's taken my whole lifetime probably to put many of these things together, the knowledge of uh, growing the different crops at the different times of the year, getting the soil fertility to the level that it's at now, and knowing how to work the soil and keep the weeds out are all a culmination of many, many years of experience that I've enjoyed having. I appreciate being able to share this with other people because this means so much to me. The cause of really good food that contains a lot of nutrition is so important and it's a great way of life. So I really thank you for allowing me to share this with you. I'm Cheryl Kristosik with Bemidji's Natural Choice Farmers Market and this is Labor Day weekend, one of our biggest weekends of the year. Our farm is Chill Creek Ridge and it's certified organic. And I like heirlooms, so I grow a lot of heirlooms and things that are very unique that you won't find other places. My interest, I've always enjoyed gardening, even as a kid when I was in junior high. I asked my mother if I could dig it. We lived in town at that point, if I could dig up a spot in the garden. So she let me put one over behind the clothesline by the rhubarb patch, and I had a little tiny plot of a garden. <laughs> when I was a kid, I would go to my grandmother's house, and I only had brothers and a co boy cousin to play with, just boys. And I'd get bored of, you know, riding on the baby bulls and jumping off the barn roofs and climbing on silos. So they, I'd say I'm bored and they would send me in the garden to pick beans and say to pick some beans and take them to town and sell them. So I'd pick beans, put them in a little brown bag, take them to town and sell for a dime or a nickel. Now that tells you <laughs> that's a long time ago. <laughs> but it's funny, I laugh about it because here I am today and I'm selling vegetables at the farmer's market. We're always trying to recruit new vendors. We are Bemidji's Natural Choice, so we encourage people to use uh, natural growing methods and natural products if they're gonna be selling them. We have some upcycled art, those types of things too. I also arrange the musicians when they come, and we have a variety of musicians that come and play for us, and that is something we're very, very grateful for because it makes it fun. When we recruit new vendors, we encourage them to uh, apply to the market. We have a form that's available online or you can contact one of the farmer's market vendors. We will put you in touch with a person that can give you a hard copy if you need a hard copy. And we fill that out. You come to one of our meetings and introduce your product and yourself. And we encourage them to bring something, especially if it's more of a craft and jams and those kinds of things. But a little bit of a sample of their product, if that's what they're doing, to share their product and how it's produced. Then we make sure it meets what we're looking for and we approve them and they join our market. 
As a purchase, purchasing food from the local farmer's market, you get to know who's growing your food, their growing methods and how they grow it, which I think personally is really important. That's why we're certified organic and all our vendors are naturally grown. Also, how far that food's been transported. And it's a hidden energy cost that we don't always think about when we're purchasing our food. And flavors there. <laughs> Shelf life. I've had sugar snap peas I've taken out of the refrigerator a month later and they've been just fine. I threw them in there because they were left over from the CSA or the farmer's market, threw them in the fridge and busy, forget about them, and I'm eating them a month later and they're just fine. Concerns that I personally have and many people do is that seeds and the genetic diversity is being lost. Worldwide, we used to have thousands of varieties that are long gone and those varieties also bring different genes into the gene pool that can help protect plant from other diseases and help with insect control. They're trying to do some of that with GMO and they're finding out that they're ending up with super weeds that the plants can't even compete with. Let's go look at some of the produce. <laughs> um, this is a black tomato. I'm not sure if it's a Cherokee purple. It's not overly ripe yet. They always have the green shoulders. I always would cut that off when I first started growing them. And then I found out that they're just as sweet and sometimes they're even sweeter than the rest of the tomato, which surprised me. And But heirlooms will often have green shoulders or they're splashed with different colors like this one where they're yellow and red. This is an Italian heirloom variety. And they can get really big like like this. <laughs> and the bottoms might not be perfect looking because they're growing so big, but you just slice this up and it still tastes fabulous. Here's another black one down here. Look at this. See how the bottoms will crack like that? But the tomato is very, very good. And this is a, another one. These are cucumbers that uh, Dale started, or, or we grow, and um, it's a pickling cucumber, and we sell and pick them and harvest them as picklers, but they also get bigger. And when he first started growing them, I says, well, those aren't going to be very good for slicing. And my cust a lot of my customers, it's their favorite cucumber for slicing, which surprised me, but it's an old heirloom variety again. Uh, prairie blush potatoes, Yukon golds. Yukon golds always have a pink eye, really tiny, pretty little pink eye. And then the gold center, it's a favorite. And the prairie blush is a variety, actually. It's a newer, it's a sport again. Guy found it in his field. <laughs> Decided, to, and it's, I can only get the seed from one place at this point for it. It'll, I'll be able to get seed other places as time goes on. And it's got a pink, pretty pink spots on it, blushed with pink. It's also got a gold center. This is Biante. This is an old heirloom. It's one of the better quality tasting old heirlooms. Really wonderful flavor. This is Red Mariah, a red potato, and this is Princess Lorette's. It's a fingerling potato. I grow about 10, 14 varieties every year of potatoes, and this is, I've been one I've grown every year, a favorite. First year, couple years I was growing these, I wasn't familiar with fingerlings. I just read that they tasted good and I wanted to grow them. And I had an old gentleman come up to me and he says, lady fingers, and he would touch the potatoes. And I would look at him, so he bought some, and. So I asked him, I says, how do you cook them? And he looked at me like I didn't know anything. He says, while you fry them. Same day, late in the afternoon, a little lady comes. She does the exact same thing. Oh, lady fingers. I so I sell her some potatoes and I ask her, how do you cook them? She gives me the same response. Like I don't know a thing. You fry them. They made the best fried potatoes I ever had. <laughs> and they're wonderful. This is a, a Romanesco zucchini. It's an Italian variety, old heirloom again. This is a smaller one. This plant, this, this squash here is only like a couple of days old and they grow that fast just in a few days. I've got all different sizes. And then this is one of my absolute favorites. This is the one that they say is the best tasting of all the summer squashes in the world. It's a tromboncino, at least that's how I say it. And it is, it's wonderful. We're hoping that we're accepted in the community and we can be a draw to the downtown area to help bring more people downtown so they can experience not only what we have to offer but the other store owners and the other people in the area. We've heard from some other store owners that yes, it has benefited them. They've seen sales increase when we have our, our markets. 
it makes you feel really proud that you live in a place where that's an option, where they could grow the food, where you don't have to provide income to some giant corporation somewhere. You can see the people who grew the food and maybe they don't have a certified organic farm, but you can talk to them and you can find out what they use on their plants and how they grow it and what they do, what they feed their chickens or their bison and whatnot. So it, it, I think it makes people feel really good to have that option, to support their local community instead of just some nameless, faceless entity somewhere. When we come to the farmer's market, you can find products that are homemade and handcrafted if it's going to be an art or craft. We get to meet the farmer, meet the grower, whether it's honey, maple syrup, or whether it's a zucchini, and how it's growing and what we're eating. And you can find foods here that you're not going to get anyplace else. You can't buy it. In fact, it's hard to find seed for some of it. I think when you eat the naturally growing food the way you feel in your life or when you wake up in the morning, you know, or the work that you can do, I think it helps you feel better and have a little bit more enjoyment in life. This is all about quality of life and trying to at least get to the optimum quality of life that you can. Thank you so much for watching. Join us again next week for another episode of Common Ground. If you have an idea for a common ground piece that pertains to North Central Minnesota, email us at legacy at lptv.org or call us at 218-333-3014. To view any episode of Common Ground online, visit us at lptv.org. episodes or segments of Common Ground, call 218-333-3020. Common Ground is brought to you by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the Vote of the People, November 4, 2008. If you enjoyed this episode of Lakeland Public Television's Common Ground, consider making a contribution at lptv.org.